you want your characters to feel as if they are in the world, as if they are real. Because as soon as you ground your character in the scene, in the environment, in what they are doing, you grounded your reader. Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel. Um, you know, January was a lot of things, but uh, content was not one of them. I'm trying, I'm trying to like get back on a schedule I've recorded and then I'm like, I don't wanna waste my time editing, so we're just going to figure it out. So today, we are going to be talking about uh, setting, but more specifically, we're gonna be talking about grounding in writing, and this is gonna be a little bit different. This is slightly more advanced than just what is setting. I think that there are a lot of those out there, and we all learned this in whatever English class. We're gonna be using this as in how do you use setting to make your characters feel as if they're living in the world. We will start with kind of basic and then we'll work our way up. That's my plan for this. So here we go. We all understand that grounding is important. It, it sets our mood. It's rainy outside and thus the characters are sad. It's setting a tone. It gives us context. Is this a rural area? And we're going to be thinking about things that have to do with things in rural areas or is it in a big city or is it, you know, in a, in a a drug den, like, those things matter. It gives us context without having to explicitly say anything. It also will influence your characters. So one character that is in a very comfortable space inside their home is now thrown into a place that they are super not comfortable with. And now we they have to figure out what to do with that. And it does build your world a little bit. I can say a cottage, but a cottage where? Is it a cottage that I would think of, which is, you know, very internet cottage quarry, or is it like a cottage, like a historic cottage, which has a very different set of connotations and looks very different? These things are all true, and we know them, and we are we are told that these are things are that are important for X, Y, and Z reasons. But the one thing that isn't necessarily explicitly said is that it grounds your character in the place. It prevents them from sort of floating in the world, not really connected to anything. So what do I mean by floating? Floating is essentially what happens when the character does not interact with their surroundings, they don't smell anything, they don't touch anything, they are just sort of there in the space, but I could have put them pretty much anywhere and it would have been the exact same scene. For example, with the rain. Um, if your character is in the middle of a storm, like they are literally standing outside in the rain and they're not getting wet, um, that that's a big sign. Um, they if it's a cold storm, they aren't getting cold. If it's a warm storm, if it's like a tropical storm, there's a feeling to that. There's that there's the humidity that that comes with the rain and possibly even sort of a relief, and they aren't feeling that. And that can you know, doubly impact whatever emotional state or whatever conflict that is happening in the scene. But we have to feel that because if we just say it was rainy and then nothing like they're disconnected from that rain, it doesn't really matter if it's raining outside then. Give you sort of a, maybe a visual clue with like what I'm talking about. Watch Corridor Crew, I'll try to link their videos somewhere. They had this really interesting uh, video about the Scorpion King. Yes, the Scorpion King scene in one of the mummies, and I never watched it, but I watched the, their video because they talk about these little minute details about the CG at the time that they tried to actually fix um, to make the CG, the character that isn't really there, feel like they're part of the scene. They aren't just some thing that was implanted in there later. And that, that's the thing is that the lighting is changed, the textures are changed, the character actually starts to feel impactful in the world, um, that it has weight. And those are these are all like little visual cues that you know people have learned over time to make sure that those things are included in CG nowadays. But you can sort of see the difference in a more visual manner of what I mean by grounding. And it really has to do with the world and the setting. Go watch them. Um, if, if this video makes no sense, I think that this this video will make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. They, they don't know I'm doing this, so yeah. Essentially what all this boils down to is that there are a lot of little minor things that all build up to make sure that your character feels like they make a difference. Either that they make the difference in their environment or their environment is having an impact on them. Either way, they aren't just existing as if in a dream where, where nothing really connects. One of the guys up Corridor Crew said this. I hope I'm getting this right. It's one of those things that's so natural and normal looking that once 
it's there. You just don't notice it at all. That is what good grounding should be. This is what good setting should be. It shouldn't be obvious that you're setting up the scene, that your characters are there in whatever place that they are in. This is sort of going into other things that we can touch upon, but to sort of introduce this concept, your character has to feel natural in their environment. Even if they are uncomfortable, they have to feel like naturally uncomfortable. This is touching up on a lot of different aspects that all have to sort of come and work together in order for them to to feel like this is a natural situation. Also, some of this is tied in things that are like character building and mundane things, even in so far as like establishing symbolism and pacing. But let's put this in a scenario where you understand where this may lead. So for example, average high school teenager may be a little bit angsty. So what we want to show is perhaps maybe what's in their bedroom. We're expecting a teenager to maybe have posters of their favorite band or their, you know, so, some sort of idol that they have. Movie posters, you know, maybe they're kind of a little bit of a, you know, a geek in some way. What do they have around their room? Do they play games? What kind of gaming setup do they have? Do they have a favorite color? Is Do they still have things that are still from their childhood? Are, are we explaining that this person is coming out of childhood? Is that the narrative that we want to uh, sort of express throughout the story that they're leaving childhood behind? and this is causing them a lot of discomfort of on the one hand just setting up the scene in their bedroom a bunch of movie posters that are super modern and like i don't know i'm i, I don't know what the teens do these days i'm fucking old now in my day would have been oh you know panic at the disco and like my chemical romance oh if they had a my chem poster we knew that they were part of the emo scene let's give them a my chem poster and and suddenly we sort of just understand as a shortcut something is happening and if you put that with maybe you know a a favorite childhood toy that's like maybe knocked over somewhere With that you've just visually told us something that's happening within that character you didn't have to handhold you didn't have to explain what was happening we could infer between the lines and then to ground your character in that scene this is this is a dilemma and so at the end of the story is the teddy bear still there is it turned upright you know or have they decided to keep on with their childhood a little bit longer or do you know do they keep that part of themselves or do they put it in the trash do they put it in the closet what is happening to that this character as a visual medium and that interaction with that object or these objects in the room makes so much of a difference. The environment matters and it grounds us. It grounds the character. This, if we had just sort of said that these things existed, the setting floats. It doesn't matter. If we don't understand the character's surroundings, we also don't really care about it because their surroundings don't matter. We have to make sure that there's a balance between the two. And here's the other thing is that I'm also not saying on, on the extreme end of this, I'm not saying like description of every leaf on every tree. That that's that's overkill and that get in, that gets into purple and if it's if it's not done right. What I am saying is that we need to make sure that we highlight the things that are important. Often you really do need more detail than you realize to make something impactful or even to sort of uh, bury the lead a little bit. You know, if you take the time to introduce a massive throne room that, you know, has certain details and whatever, your reader may not take it all in. The banners are blue. I don't care about the particular, like, azure color of these stupid banners. But by the end, you're like, oh shit, the banners, they've changed. The banners are still blue, the country's still there, but they're at war now, and the banners are significantly darker. You've just embedded meaning, and you've just you've just put in storytelling in a banner. The readers may not notice it at first. You may not even notice it at first, but you need to pay attention to the fact that you made the banners azure blue, and that could potentially mean something down the road. This doesn't have to necessarily be even color descriptions or anything. Um, what is the feel of the place in Office Space, for example? I can't remember his name because I'm a terrible person. The character has this office space that is very cramped and is like piled high and we're like wow this is this is a person who is buried and the the way that they they created their space or is, uh, the space has been created for them really um it it impacts them they start to really go a little bit paranoid um, about about their space. They're very, very particular because there is, there's not a lot of space for them. They're being taken over by their work and then they get put into the basement, which is even worse. They have no light. They don't have anyone to talk to. It smells like them interacting in that space is incredible. It gives you a sense of, of everything crowding in around you. And you know, at the end, it's no surprise that he 
burned down the office. And that's, again, that's visual storytelling with honestly just space. Yes, he has dialogue and yes, he has interactions with everyone, but most of what we know about this character is how in he interacts with his office with his workspace. It's brilliantly done. He's grounded in that space. So how do you know if your character is floating or not? Um, and th this is kind of hard to understand because the natural thing to do one way or the other is to either super ground them. There's so much action, there's so much description and we get kind of bored. And the other end, which is usually the floaty bit, is that they have a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue and not a lot of motion going on. Um, sometimes this has to happen. If you're in you're in a business meeting, um, there's there's not going to be a whole lot of like overt movement. In a professional environment, there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, facial expressions either. Bored is a really common facial expression, but you can't really do much with bored. So a lot of times you can't necessarily avoid it, but if you continually see that you set up your scene and then you have a ton of dialogue and nothing happens, your characters are probably floating. Even if it's something small, they fidget, they look elsewhere, they, they start to notice other things. That's interacting without actually physically maneuvering anything in the scene, but you really should be trying to sort of choreograph your characters around the environment. Uh, another thing that you will find that is very common is when um, there's no consequences for something that has happened or you, you you sort of lose track of what has happened for example there's a fight and someone is thrown against a wall that should hurt your character should grimace your character should you know hold on to whatever you know body part that just slammed into the wall they might be bruised they might be bleeding um depending on how hard they might have broken a bone if those things don't happen then your character is floating there was no consequence for the action that was just taken even if you say that they interacted with the environment if there's no consequence for it they're still floating this is sort of a, a logical thing and something that you have to sort of embody and practice. Sometimes you forget where you put something. I do this all the time. I'm moving a lot of things in a scene. I'm moving, you know, three or four people and they're interacting with, you know, a cup and someone else is eating something and someone else is, you know, slightly taking notes. I'm like, okay, so how many pages have they made notes of? Did somebody refill that water glass already? Oh God, smoking. Smoking is the thing that really gets me all the time. Did they already light the cigarette? Did they already flick the ash off? How many puffs have they taken? Did they already stub it out? Are they still smoking? The, there are consequences for what you put down on paper. And sometimes you just lose track of it. And thus you just find out that your character is smoking ghost cigarette. This is where editing comes in and it is your friend. It's totally fine to find your ghost cigarette. It's totally fine to realize the character was drinking water and you realize that it's now uh, beer. Sometimes this ends up being a floaty experience. You haven't grounded your character. There's inconsistency. These are the things you'll catch. We do need to talk a little bit about Chekhov's gun. What is Chekhov's gun? There was a, a, a story in which I believe it was in the first scene. There was a fireplace and above the fireplace that was described to be a gun. What this means in, in a rating context is that if you describe something, it should have impact. So if you see Chekhov's gun, you expect the gun to be used at some point. This is where you sort of figure out what is important and what is not important in your description of, in grounding. Uh, another great example of this is in Phantom of the Opera, at least in the uh, stage play. This chandelier that was featured in the great crash of whatever year it was, you know, it lights up and it's, it's this huge dramatic moment that this chandelier goes up over the audience. If that chandelier never crashes, even though we've been told that it does, we are going to be severely disappointed and there was zero reason for us to have gotten that detail. If that ever happens to you, you need to either make it a priority to fix it and make, you know, do something with that or cut out entirely because then it's extraneous and we don't care. And not only that, we may even feel a little bit as a reader uh, betrayed because we were so hoping for that crash. We were so hoping for the gun to be used and it never gets used. And we're very confused as to why we wasted our time doing that. And like I said earlier, you can sort of bury the lead on some of these, which is a different technique entirely. But as a typical thing, unless it means something, unless it is adding to what you are trying to accomplish or setting it up for something in the future, it probably does not need to be described. And it's totally fine if on your first draft, you don't know what needs to be described. I'm an overwriter. I write out every single detail and then I'm like, ooh, this is cool and this is cool and this has, this has bearing and this has meaning and I just add all the things. And then when I go back and I'm like, okay, so I didn't really, really need to um, describe the bookshelf in that much detail. It's just a bookshelf. 
cool, we know that they're a reader, done. And I had to cut out a lot of things. And on the flip side of that, if you are an underwriter, sometimes you're like, well, I don't really know what's in this room, but I'm gonna say that there is a bed and there's going to be a nightstand and there's gonna be some shoes, you know, scattered all over the floor. And later on you realize that, oh, maybe I need to add uh, a broken lamp. And that's going to be a, a thing that I need later on. So you go back in your editing and you add in a broken lamp to your scene. And then that way you can make your character more consistently interacting with this broken lamp. All in all, this is kind of why grounding is important and why it is intricately tied into setting and your story. You want your characters to feel as if they are in the world, as if they are real. Because as soon as you ground your character in the scene, in the environment, in what they are doing, you grounded your reader and you caught their attention and it starts to feel real to your audience. And you'll find out that you can build up a lot more nuance in your story and in your character development and in what you want to portray and your symbolism and everything else. As soon as you ground your character in the scene, in the world, as always, practice, practice. So the takeaway take points. Your setting has to do more than just what your 10th grade teacher told you setting was. Everything should be pulling at least double duty, if not triple or quadruple duty. Ground your character by making the setting impactful to them and them impactful to the setting. Give meaning to the world building in a practical and symbolic way. Setting may show us time, place, mental state, and potential story, plot points, and, and character development, and it may foreshadow major events. Grounding a character should feel so natural to the storytelling that you don't really notice it as a reader. It should feel seamless and work across the board with what you are doing. In order to make sure that you are not having your characters float, make sure that everything that you describe has some sort of impact on what is happening, has bearing and consequence to what is happening, and does not waste the reader's time. All of these things do not have to be perfect on a first draft. Editing is your friend, especially when it comes to things like this, because this is not the thing that you are focusing on necessarily right now. The grounding is going to enrich your world, your book, your characters much, much more. And sometimes you need to know what's going on in the world and what's going on in your story, what narrative you're telling before you can actually figure out how to do this in scene. That's all I have to say for grounding. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below if you have not already for content that will be similar but better than this. I really hope that you got something out of this and that it made a whole bunch of sense. Um, again, go, go watch Corridor Crew and that video. They have a couple others like this. Th these sorts of things that you learn from other artists are very applicable to writing as well. If you find uh, something else that is really interesting, a, a topic that comes up, um, leave it in the comments, like link me, tag me, something. I'll check it out and maybe talk a little bit about how this applies to writing. I guess that's all, so I'll see you in the next video. All right, bye. She said it will never go away. I know there is nothing left to say. Can we try to hold on just for now? Even if we don't know how to show them what we're all about. Oh, oh, oh.